as our voices we raise and our shouts of joy ring out. Know that the Lord is God, it is He who made us, we His people sing. Let the ground shake as our voices we raise and our shouts of joy ring out. Know that the Lord is God, it is He who made us, we His people Sing. Oh, shout for joy, all the earth, as we enter in His gates. Give thanks to Him, praise His name, for He is good, His love is forever. is forever. So let's lift our voices and give Him a shout of praise. He's the Prince of Peace and He's the King of all kings. Prince of Peace, King of Kings, Alpha, Omega, His love is forever. The Lord of Lords, the Lamb of God, the Lion of Judah, His love is forever. Greetings. Thank you so much for tuning in to Living Strong today. As always, it's our joy and privilege to be able to come to you 
and bring God's word to you and also spend time with you uh, in prayer. We're looking at the life of David uh, in the Bible. Uh, David is uh, very dear to many of us because, first of all, we recognize what God said about David uh, when he called him a man after my own heart, which is something very notable, uh, uh, very uh, commendable for God to say that about a person, that here's a person who's after my own heart. David, David is also very dear to us because uh, he expressed the purpose of his life. He said, uh, this is the one thing that I desire, to dwell in the house of the Lord, to behold and to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire at his temple. That means I want to engage with God. I want to be in communion with God. That is my one desire. And so we are calling this series, David Man of One Desire. And we're examining his life, his journey with God, and just drawing some lessons, insights that we could take for our own selves, uh, things that we could learn about what it is for us to uh, grow and become people uh, after God's own heart, people of one desire, and yet at the same time we are journeying through uh, the real situations of life. We have the ups and the downs, we have uh, the challenges, we have the difficulties, we have sometimes disappointments, uh, we have our own failures. And so uh, how do we journey with God in the midst of all of this and yet be people after God's own heart, yet maintain that one desire and make sure that God remains the center of our focus as we journey through life. And so uh, we've divided our examination of David's life into four stages. We talked about uh, David's formative years in our earlier program. Uh, today we'll talk about David's fugitive years and in the coming weeks we'll talk about his famous years and then we'll talk about his final years and then bring some closing thoughts to, uh, on, on his life. Now, uh, after David had reached that place of uh, national recognition for killing Goliath uh, and uh, people everywhere were celebrating David's success, uh, David, uh, of course, was uh, immediately beginning to feel the pushback from uh, King Saul uh, because now Saul had become jealous of him. Uh, Saul actually wanted to get rid of him. And so David now finds himself in that precarious position. What should he do? People loved him, but the king hated him. And eventually uh, we see, of course, that David, uh, because of his friendship with Jonathan, who was a king's son, King Saul's son, David gets inside information that Saul is definitely bent on killing him. So Jonathan advises him, or Jonathan assigns to him that, look, it's time for you to leave and run for your life. So we pick up from there where David is actually on the run. He's, uh, he's running for his life. This is 1 Samuel chapter 21 all the way to 2 Samuel chapter 1 is, where we, is what we will cover uh, under David's fugitive years. And uh, uh, some of the things that we see David do in 1 Samuel, the 21st chapter, as he begins his run for his life, is very questionable. Uh, the first thing he does is he goes and he lies to the priest. Uh, he tells the priest, you know, I am on an assignment by the king. Actually, he's running for his life. Uh, so it's a blatant lie. And the, the priest believes it. Uh, and then he says, you know, I need something to eat. And the priest gives him the leftover showbread, which actually David is not supposed to be eating. David has it anyway. The other thing we see also is that uh, uh, right in that First Samuel chapter 21, David feigns madness before uh, Axios, king of Gath. Uh, one of the Philistine rulers, local uh, uh, rulers there. He pretends madness and he escapes from there. So, you know, uh, in, in that we see the human side of David emerging. Uh, and this is something we will find uh, throughout David's life, that David was just a normal person like you and me. And uh, uh, we will see many other failures and flaws. We'll also see some very notable strengths and characteristics um, wonderful character traits in David's life, uh, which we should definitely emulate. But then we will also see the, the flaws. We'll also see the, the weaknesses uh, in David's life. And uh, as we look at these things, uh, it is important for us to understand that in spite of all of this, God would say about David, he is a man after my own heart. And David could say, I have one desire. I want to pursue God. 
you know, that teaches us something that, look, we as people uh, journeying through life, we will have our weaknesses, uh, we will have our failures, we will have our flaws, but neither, none of those things should deter us from pursuing God, that God can still remain the center of our focus, that our desire and our passion for God can still be strong and intense, even though we are battling our flaws, our weaknesses, our, our own you know, difficulties and all of that. We can still say, God, our, deep down in my heart, my one desire is you. I know I've got flaws, I know I've got weaknesses, but I am pursuing you. So we, we look past those flaws of David, those weaknesses of David, and uh, in chapter 22 of 1 Samuel, we see David, uh, he's homeless, uh, he's, you know, he's dwelling in what, what was called the caves, cave of Adullam. Uh, he's just dwelling there and it's all the time on the lookout. You know, Saul must be sending some soldiers, some army to get me. So he has to be on the alert all the time. Now, while he's dwelling in the caves, of course, his, his family members come to meet him. Maybe, you know, just, just console him or just let assure him that they are still you know, they still care for him. And what is interesting is while he's in the cave of Adullam, there are about 400 men who come to David and they say, David, we want to join with you. Now, very interesting, the Bible highlights in 1 Samuel 22 that uh, these 400 men, they had certain things in common. All 400 of them were in distress, they were in debt, and they were discontented. It's interesting, the Bible highlights that, meaning these 400 men were just totally upset about life. They were in bad shape themselves. They were in distress and they were all in debt. I mean, they, were, they owed stuff to people. And, and, and here these 400 men band together and say, David, we want to join with you. Now, uh, David's reaction is very interesting. That David says, come, I'll take you. And De David makes these 400 men part of his army. And uh, by the time we come to the end of 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 30, we see that this army has grown to 600 men. So there are these 600 men who form David's army. They band together with David. They're not great people. They are actually people who are in really bad shape. And yet in all of this, God is doing something. God is setting up an army for David. And these very men are going to be the mighty men of David's army once he becomes king. There's a lesson for us here that as we pursue God, as we seek Him and make Him the center of our focus, and as we journey through what may seem the difficult times of life, like what David was going through, even in the difficult times, God is setting things up. God is orchestrating things for us which will stand us in good stead for the future. Can you imagine that these 400 men who came to David, who are all in debt and distress and discontented, became the mighty warriors in David's army when he became king? David didn't reject them. David didn't have no idea that that would happen one day. But God was orchestrating something while David was going through his life as a fugitive, uh, running from cave to cave, from place to place, uh, homeless and as a, as a homeless wanderer. So God is orchestrating things. Even in your difficult seasons of life, God is putting things in place for the future he has in mind for you. Now, while David has this little army of people with him, uh, uh, we see something very interesting here uh, that, Dave, that we, we see as a strength in David's life. Uh, the Philistines uh, were, were fighting and they had decided to, uh, and you know, they were fighting uh, uh, and David had several encounters with the Philistines, but this is the, probably the first one on record with his 400 men. And David decides, you know, should I go, uh, David wants to decide, should I go out to fight the Philistines or not? And at that time, David does something very interesting, very important, very notable. In 1 Samuel chapter 23, verses 1 to 5, the Bible records that David inquires of the Lord. He says, God, should I go with my men and fight the Philistines or not? And God says, go. And so David goes out, fights, he wins the battle, comes back. But this is a very notable thing because we find David repeatedly doing this. And this is recorded for us. That time and again, when David had to make important decisions that would affect the people that were with him, the nation, he would inquire of God. He would say, God, should I do this or should I not? 
and God would speak to him and then David would obey. And based on that, he saw great success. So David inquiring of God is a, a, a character, character trait, I, I would say, that we need to imbibe. That we need to take time to ask God, Lord, what do I need to do? It was uh, uh, something that David repeated in his life. Uh, right there in the same chapter, 1 Samuel 23, we see once again, while David and his men were in this place called Keilah, uh, he got news that Saul was coming after him. So David does something again. Uh, it, is, uh, uh, you know, it is something that he should not have done, but he did it anyway. He told Abithar, who was the son of the priest, uh, who now had, was the priest, was carrying the ephod. The ephod is the priestly robe which only the priests were supposed to use. David puts that robe on and he goes before praise and he asks God, God, please tell me, should I and my people stay here in Keilah or should we leave? And God speaks to him and says, you need to leave because these people, if Saul comes here, they're going to hand you over to Saul. So David, based on what God spoke to him, leaves that place and he and his people are protected. Again, I want to highlight here David doing something which technically he's not supposed to be doing. He was not appointed priest and yet for him to wear that priestly robe and go before God, uh, God overlooks that. Now why? We don't have the answer other than the fact that God chose to overlook it and God chose to respond. And uh, the thing that we can say is God was looking at David's heart. David's heart was after God and he, his heart was in the right place. What he was doing was wrong, but his heart was right there saying, God, I need to hear from you. What should I do? You are my only help. And God speaks to him and David's life is preserved. So David continues like this as a fugitive, as a homeless wanderer, move, moving from place to place. Uh, now we estimate that this must have been a 10 year period in David's life. Again, we don't know for sure. But we can estimate it like this. If David was 17 years of age, when he went out to kill Goliath, and he, you know, he, he had the great victory, and then he, we give him a few years uh, right after that uh, with Saul. And let's say he was about 20 years of age when he had to run for his life. When, when uh, you know, time came, Jonathan gave him news, he had run. Uh, David then later on became king when he was about 30. So we have this 10-year period uh, estimated that uh, David was running for his life. He was living as a fugitive. So he went from cave to cave, and, uh, but definitely God was preserving him. God was protecting him. Now we see something during this, this 10 year period that bring out some very positive traits in David's life on two occasions. First, uh, the first time was in the wilderness of En Gedi. Uh, and then there was another time when it, uh, in the wilderness of Ziph. On two occasions, when Saul, King Saul, came out with his army to uh, attack David, David, uh, uh, of course, was in a place of safety, but he had the opportunity on two occasions to kill King Saul. This was, uh, this was in 1 Samuel 24, and we see this recorded again in 1 Samuel 26. Saul was there, and David and his men had Saul as an open target and they could have killed King Saul. And on both occasions, uh, uh, David's own men encouraged him. Hey, God has given your enemy in your hand. Kill him. And, but on both occasions, David's response is simply this. He says, how can I raise my hand against the Lord's anointed? You know, uh, even though Saul was after David's own life, David refused to kill him because he recognized that God had put him in this place of honor. God had made him king, and David had no right to do this against God's appointed person. So he says, how can I raise my hand against God's anointed? Uh, uh, and, uh, and see, on both occasions, he simply rests his case with God. He said, God will take care of this. The Lord will be my judge. He will take care of this for me. I don't have to defend myself. So this brings out a very important character trait of David, that he really honored God's anointed. He honored the man uh, whom God had put in that place of authority. David himself was a man of honor. That's why he understood honor. That's why he honored the person whom God had placed in authority. And secondly, we see very importantly that David rested his case with God. He said, God, you will take care of things. I don't have to take matters into my own hands. 
If you anointed me king, you'll make me king at the right time. I don't have to rush into it. Some important lessons there for us to learn. Now, uh, we see that as David was making this journey out in the wilderness, uh, we see a very interesting thing, a very interesting period. There was a period of time, maybe about three years, where uh, 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 1 Samuel 27, 28, uh, and 29, uh, where David actually joined with the Philistines. And uh, he's, you know, he went back to King Akshish and Gath, and he said, you know, I'll be part of your army. I will be with you. And the king, he was more than well willing to have David be there. And so it seemingly, uh, you know, it, 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 but David was very clever. He pretended to be part of the Philistines, but he really wasn't uh, with them in the sense that he was not attacking Israel. Uh, but he just, for his own safety, he took that posture. Again, you see David uh, doing something that may not necessarily be right, but yet it was wise for him at that time to protect him and his own people by taking that place. The last thing I want to point out here in uh, the last two things there, uh, in 1 Samuel, the 30th chapter, we see a very uh, difficult situation uh, when David uh, and his men were in Ziklag. They had left Ziklag to go to a battle. When they came back, they found that the Amalekites, another tribe, had come and attacked Ziklag, taken all their family away, all the possessions away. So David and his men were so discouraged, disheartened, to the point where the men who were with David wanted to stone David. They were so upset with their own leader. But we see something very wonderful here. David strengthened himself in God. He and he prays and he asks God, God, can I go and pursue these people? And God says, go, you will recover all. So David strengthened himself in God. He had such a deep personal relationship with God that even his own people were feeling disheartened and wanted to turn against him. He could draw strength from God. And then he went out and they fought the Amalekites and recovered all. The last thing I want to point out here from David's fugitive years is that finally, in 2 Samuel chapter 1, when David gets news about Saul and Jonathan and the other men of Israel dying in battle, David mourns for them. He honors them. He, he, he releases a psalm of, 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 of a prayer of uh, uh, of, of a, or, or words that acknowledge the greatness of Saul and Jonathan. Uh, he's not, you know, thrilled or happy that they have died in battle, but he honors them and he mourns for them. Uh, it shows us the heart of David that even though Saul was against his own life, yet David honored him to the point that when Saul died, David mourned for Saul and David recognized how great a man Saul was, how great, wonderful a person Jonathan was and so on. So we see once again, David was a man of great honor. Hi there, we're so delighted to introduce to you our free church app. Uh, this app is loaded with features and resources that will greatly enrich your life. So head out to the app or Google Play stores, search for All People's Church Bangalore and download the app right now. It's gonna greatly enrich your journey with God. We trust that our journey uh, through these chapters in 1 Samuel chapter 21 all the way to chapter 30 and 2 Samuel chapter 1, just examining David's fugitive years, highlighting certain traits uh, in David's life and seeing how God is at work in the life of someone whose heart is set on him would encourage you. That you and I would draw lessons, would draw inspiration, and you and I would choose to be people after God's own heart, people of one desire. Let's pray before we close. Father, we pray that we will draw inspiration from David's life, knowing that you are at work in our lives, even as we go through the turbulent seasons of life. And like David, may we learn to strengthen ourselves in you. May we learn to inquire of you. May we learn to pursue you even through such seasons of life. Pray a blessing on everyone listening, that each one will be strengthened, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for being with us on the program today. And until next time, remember, live life the Jesus way.
As I was reading Psalm 27, I kept praying and asking God for a fresh revelation and somehow David's strong desire to be in the house of the Lord just jumped out of that passage. And I was reminded of this picture of the prodigal son feeling completely dejected, defeated, lonely, scared, and, and as he's walking back home, he's got his head down and he lifts his head up and he sees his father running towards him with his arms wide open, welcoming him back home. And God's so gracious, he welcomes us back no matter how far we've gone away from him and no matter how scared we may be, he just brings us back to his home, which is filled with singing, dancing, and it's just such a joyous place to be in. And that picture helped me understand what David was feeling when he said that he, want, he had that strong desire to be in the house of the Lord. In your house I am safe and secure My rock, my tower, Lord, you are my shelter my rock, my tower, Lord, you are my shelter. All People's Church is happy to announce the release of three new publications, The Father's Love, Baptism in the Holy Spirit and Gifts of the Holy Spirit. These are available for free. These resources are ideal for personal study, for use in small groups, churches and ministries. You can download them at apcwo.org slash publications or request a free copy by writing to us at contact at apcwo.org.